Okay, today, two of the best, most beautifully animated films of all time, Bambi and The Incredibles. As I mentioned in an earlier review, these two films appear to have nothing in common except that they're both intensely focused on masculinity. Seriously, my imaginary audience member replies, a cutesy early Disney classic about baby forest animals and a flashy 2000s CGI superhero film? Yep. I'd go so far as to say that The Incredibles is the sequel which Bambi needed for 70 years. Yes, that's absurd, but I came to compare these two movies and I'm all out of bubblegum. In my childhood, Bambi was one of those Disney classics that popped up in theaters every few years, and it had clips showcased on the Disney Channel. I never thought about it much, until one day, when I was a jet-lagged college student in France with nothing to do and knowing nobody, I wandered into a local cinema that was showing Bambi as a Saturday matinee. Not only was the film far more beautiful than I recognized as a child, if you haven't seen the documentary, Tyrus, go do so. The late, great Tyrus Wong was a master. But it felt like the movie was telling 20-year-old me how to be a man. It's all about the legs. The movie opens up with forest animals rushing to see the newborn prince of the forest, Bambi. His first princely act is to try and stand up, something that Bambi's future BFF Thumper sums up as... Kind of wobbly, isn't it? But hey, a fawn can stand on day one, and it took me about 12 months to work that out. Newborn Bambi learns to speak and socialize. Flower! He can call me a flower if he wants to. But his legs continue to come up as a sight gag, with Thumper trying to teach him to run, to jump, and later on to stand on ice. Always the legs. <coughs> you gotta watch both ends at the same time. Spring comes, and Bambi and his mother join the other deer in the meadow. He meets a spunky young doe named Feline, who seems to be headed into adolescence, while Bambi is still tottering around in childhood. A confounded Bambi trips into a puddle. Again, the legs. Just as Bambi's trying to work out this confusing, flirty young girl, trumpets blast to announce the arrival of the stags. It's a glorious explosion of testosterone. All these stunning males leaping across the screen, and Bambi is just amazed. It's like he suddenly realizes what he wants to be, and why he should be moving forward. So help me, it reminds me of War and Peace, when Nikolai sees the real soldiers in a parade with the Tsar, cheering and driving his horse forward alongside them. Like Nikolai, Bambi's not really ready for that yet. And then all the stags come to a halt. They pull up short because the great prince of the forest has arrived. Regal, aloof, frighteningly strong. Bambi's mother explains that he's the great prince because he's older and wiser than all the other stags. She doesn't mention that he's Bambi's father, which reminds us of his appearance earlier on in the film, watching his son being born from a faraway cliff. No engagement, just regal aloofness. And then the traumatizing event happens that everybody remembers. Bambi's mother is killed while trying to protect him. Finally, after this, the great prince comes out of the dark and calls him son for the very first time and decides to raise his kid. It is a chilly, sad scene, and it doesn't promise a lot of laughs for Bambi's future. Next comes the Twitter-pated sequence when Bambi, Thumper, and Flower have reached maturity. Each falls for a mate. One of the very few complaints I have with this film is the cartoonishness of a couple of sight gags here, but few other films can match the elegance of the other 99.999% of this movie. Bambi's friends disappear one by one into their new family lives, as happens after college. Bambi discovers that Feline's flirting no longer annoys him, and were cast into a romantic dream world. Their anti-gravity leaps recall the gallop of the stags earlier when Bambi first witnessed what masculinity could look like in its full flower. But this is interrupted by another stag challenging Bambi for Feline. At first, Bambi slinks off, until it's obvious that Feline does not want this new relationship. You could read an ugly meaning into this, and say that Bambi is winning Feline like a trophy, but she's actually already made it clear from day one that she has her sights set on Bambi, and here, he's realizing for the first time that being in a relationship requires him to be taking an active role, to engage with Feline's problems. It's not always clouds and roses. The overall message of this film is, manage your business. And when Bambi is faced with real danger, first the hunting pack threatening Feline and then the forest fire, the legs come back to haunt him. He's winged by a hunter. And when his father arrives to tell him to take care of business, get up. we get an echo of Thumper. You must get up. 
He saves Feline, he navigates the fire and rejoins the forest community, and he takes his place as the new great prince of the forest. But in that last bittersweet shot, Bambi's way up on that cliff with his father, watching his new family from afar. It's a very much 1930s family model. Bambi is there to fight battles and bring home the bacon, but he leaves the child rearing to Feline, just as his father did. You can see how that would resonate with mothers and fathers in the wake of Pearl Harbor. Both the great prince and Bambi's mother are presented as parental ideals, but adulthood in Bambi is in some ways a very cold and lonely affair. Which brings me to The Incredibles. The Incredibles picks up essentially where Bambi leaves off. Like Bambi, Mr. Incredible has fought his battles and he's found his wife, and now what? But if we're gonna make this work, you gotta be more than Mr. Incredible. Like Bambi, The Incredibles is gorgeous, had groundbreaking animation, sports a lush soundtrack, and features the fierce, self-sacrificing love of a mother. But all of that's secondary to the main plot, which is about, again, what does it mean to be a man? Bambi finds a mate, and like his father, he expects kids to raise themselves. The Incredibles picks that up and runs with it. Mr. Incredible, Bob Parr, has hit a bump in his career, so he drops everything and he leaves the family work to his wife, Helen. I need you to intervene! You want me to intervene? Okay! <laughs> His only joy is in reminiscing about the time before he had boring responsibilities with his buddy, Frozone. And then comes the seven-year itch in the form of Mirage, an appropriate name, by the way. She offers sexy excitement and the chance to prove himself professionally. Bob leaps at the opportunity. Of course, it fails. There is no perfect job. Every manager, whether it's a petty jerk or a brilliant megalomaniac, is just a flawed human. The upside of this movie, upside A, is that Bob recognizes that he's fallen off. Oh my God, you've gotten fat. Come in, come, come. He goes for an exercise self-improvement regime, and it seems to work. His marriage gets better, his physique gets better. The downside is that he tries to do it all alone. Helen and the kids are all very capable people. Bob doesn't even see his own village, and he tries to save the world solo. This is a thing a lot of men, including myself, do. This movie has a lot of things to say about motherhood, too. The scene where Helen shouts at her kids as their airplane's about to be destroyed is maybe, for me, the most emotional scene in any animated film. Bambi loses his mother, but Dash and Violet realize they have no idea who their mother is. Still, that's not the focus of this particular video. Upside B, Helen and the kids have Bob's back, and when he finally pulls his head out of where he's been keeping his head, Bob Parr realizes that he married the best woman possible. He had the best kids possible, and he can achieve amazing things if he just lets go of his need to be number one. Bambi never quite gets that far. He has an amazing fight against the hunting dogs to save Feline, but ultimately the film is about Bambi saving Bambi. The Incredibles takes that and turns it into Mr. Incredible forming The Incredibles, because he recognizes that Mr. Incredible is not alone. So, while Bambi he does spend a lot of time developing his relationships, his childhood friends all take a backseat to Feline, and that last shot seems to be setting up a traditional but chilly boundary. The film ends as it began, with a distant father who seems emotionally unengaged. It's the circle of life, if you will, and it's a circle that Disney kept repeating even through the early days of the Disney Renaissance. The Little Mermaid is an exception, but that's another rant for another day. I love that film. Bambi is a masterpiece, and it's inspirational to me personally, but frankly, I'm grateful to live in Bob Parr's world instead.